Okay, welcome everyone to, I've lost count now what number of meeting this is, but to another existence group meeting. We welcome Matthew today. Thank you for joining us, Matthew. Because um, it's Peter and Adele here. Uh, we also are broadcasting live on using Zoom, but so far no one has joined yet. The joys of load shedding <laughs> in this country. But oh well, they always have the recording. So, yeah, to, to begin, just to say thank you to Beverly here at Protea Bookshop in Bloomington, at Bloomgate Center, for hosting us again. And uh, I don't know how timely you are listening to this, if you're listening to the recording, but they are currently having a book sale, so do pop by. Um, but yeah, we're continuing this week with Simone de Beauvoir. Last week we spoke about uh, the chapter from the book called Personal Freedom and Others, where we looked at these different types of people that the Beauvoir identifies and basically uh, the different ways they handle freedom, or the, the lack thereof, we can say, in some of the cases. So this, this week we are looking at the sort of penultimate chapter of the book, the one where she discusses a bit about what she means by this word ambiguity. And that is obviously from the title of the book, The Ethics of, of Ambiguity. And um, last time we had a nice discussion, Adele, you asked the question and you made a joke about um, the ethics of ambiguity and the ambiguity of ethics. And I think that, that, that joke, uh, that play on words is going to come in to play this week. Um, so, I there's a few things I want to discuss. Very Something on that. I don't remember where it is now. Um, there's a few things I want to discuss about ambiguity and the ambiguousness of ethics. But before that, I just want to start with this distinction that Beauvoir makes at the beginning of the chapter um, between the notion of ambiguity. And absurdity. Now, again, I said the existentialists love their A words you know, alienation, authenticity, anxiety, mm -hmm. angst, mm -hmm. ambiguity. Absurdity. I, that. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's like you have all these philosophers with uh, P surnames and A surnames and H surnames. <laughs> and it's always like in clusters, like all the Germans have an H surname. Um, but do you understand the distinction between these two terms? And do you know what she's talking about? Here? She's making reference to someone else, another existentialist. Is she referring to Camus? Yes. When she says absurdity. Yeah, so the concept of absurdity comes from the work of Albert Camus, not Camus. Don't make that mistake, because that's what I did <laughs> when I started philosophy. I, uh, okay, them, so I called them Camus for years. Yeah, me too. <laughs> but luckily, I'm rehabilitated now. So, <laughs> um, But in his book, The Myth of Sisyphus, he talks about what he calls absurdity and the absurdity of things. I'm going to ask a question about that now. But we'll be doing that book next year. It's on the list. Myth of Sisyphus, and also his other book, The Rebel. So... That's still to come, but I am going to talk a bit about this because it is an important distinction to make. Um, Peter, have you read the Myth of Sisyphus? No, unfortunately yeah. not. Have you read any existentialist mm. philosophy at all? You haven't read the Myth of Sisyphus. Do you guys know... Okay, so the, there's Albert Camus' book, The Myth of Sisyphus, but then there is actually the actual myth of Sisyphus. Do, do you guys know Do you know what the Myth of Sisyphus mm. is? Do either of you want to... Explain it. Um, damn, I don't know if I got all the details uh, in order, but basically Sisyphus was a character in ancient Greek mythology. He was a king. He was a king, yeah. And an extremely deceivious king. He always tried to deceive the gods in some way. I'm not sure in what, which way. He, he, cheated, he cheated death. Precisely. He cheated death, that's yeah. the thing, yeah. And of course, yeah. gods being gods that didn't take easy to them and they kind of um so they fake all the arts they gave him the fate to roll up a boulder up a hill and then once he got up and it rolls down the other side he needs to go again and roll it up again from the other side and use this for 
it perpetually for mm -hmm. each limit. Yeah, this is basically yeah. It's it's mm -hmm. it's Sisyphus gets punished eternally. Uh, in the Greek mythology, the place is called Tartarus. It's basically their version of hell. And Camus talks about this myth in terms of how we experience our lives. It feels like we're constantly rolling a rock up a hill, and just when you're about to reach the top, everything comes tumbling back down. And you're caught in this loop. I always joke with people that the real myth of Sisyphus is washing dishes every day. You wash them, and no sooner they wash them, you're eating out of them, and they're dirty again. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so what? What people kind of get this notion of absurdity wrong. And, We'll speak about this in June. That's, I think, when we scheduled our post. I have the calendar. You know, I think I've shown yeah. the calendar to you. I'll post the calendar in December for that. But um, the idea with the absurdity is that the, the way we experience the world is that the world doesn't really seem to have any intrinsic innate meaning to it. Um, as much as people, and we spoke about this last time when we talked, spoke about the concept of seriousness, I don't know if you remember, about taking things too seriously mm -hmm. and people uh, have this notion that there are these objective values that exist out there that can direct their lives. And Camus says when we realize that those aren't really there, then it's not that the universe itself is meaningless. Is that it's that we experience our relationship with it as meaningless. So even if the universe does have some sort of meaning, which Camus, Camus doesn't think it does, does have, uh, that's sort of irrelevant. That relationship, that connection, is what he calls the absurd. And what what Simone de Beauvoir is saying about ambiguity is and how to differentiate from absurdity is where absurdity denies, says we can never really overcome that gap. There's always going to be this sense of meaninglessness in things. Ambiguity means that we create our own meaning. Mm -hmm. That there's this weird thing where, me, where meaning, where things are both meaningless in the sense that they don't exist out there, but they can be meaningful because we can make them. We can put them out there. And that's what we've been speaking about in terms of the distinction between subjectivity and objectivity. Subjectivity being you know, what comes, what's, what goes on inside of you, and objectivity being outside, but not because it comes from outside, but because it comes from out of you and you put it outside. They uh, talk about objectifying something like your book. You know? When you write your book, you are objectifying yourself mm -hmm. in the world through your heart, right? Um, it becomes an object in the world that communicates your subjectivity mm -hmm. because it's your story. Yeah. Um, and that is, in a sense, what, what Simone is saying about ambiguity is through things like that, we can start rendering meaning in existence. I don't know if I entirely agree with her in this. I do think she's correct. There is a difference between absurdity and ambiguity. But like I said, we're going to discuss that next year. So I'll go into more detail about that then. Uh, we can just make a note. But it's just another A word to add um, to the list. Anything you want to ask about these two terms? I, I, I want to ask something, but I think we might actually touch on that later on. Okay, we'll, we'll get to that then. I think I will say this. Um, you know, Camus himself didn't say you know, that he wasn't an existentialist, that he was a absurdist. Mm -hmm. And I think part of this is because him and... You sort of have Albert Camus on the one side and then the power couple, Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir, on that side in terms of how the existentialist looks, and that's, I think, why Camus says he's not an existentialist, because he's taking them as representing existentialism. But I think within the larger context of existentialism, it definitely would include him. 
But that's just sort of more of like an academic notion. I, I find this with philosophy, I find this with art, with music, anything like that. A musician or an artist or whoever doesn't pick their genre, they just go out and they make their music, they paint their pictures, mm -hmm. they write their books. It's for the audience to put them into genres. Um, but I think today, I mean, I want to I want to deviate a bit here, and I don't want you to feel like I'm I'm, I'm picking on you now, Dale. But um, I think this applies in general. I think we can all come across this. We often come across texts that are difficult to read, and, and you mentioned that you had some difficulty with it. I must admit, I had a lot of difficulty with this text when I started reading it. I've read it a few times, so it does get easier. But I remember the first time I. A lot of times, what is this? Yeah, I what really is she going on about? It seems like she waffles a lot about mm -hmm. inconsequential things. Yeah, no, I, just, I read the whole thing, and you yeah. she uses some terms like frequently, but you can't really pinpoint mm -hmm. what she refers to mm -hmm. by those points. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah. so, what I want to say about that is, um, you know, I, I, I tell people there's no obligation to read the, the works before you come here. If you want to just come and sit and listen and chat, that's fine. But I always encourage people to at least give the text a try. Even if you don't make it all the way, even if you make it all the way and you don't understand everything, that's fine. And, I mean, I've used this analogy before, you would have heard me say it, but to me it's kind of like exercise. Really it's a form of training. You go out and you lift your weights every day. When you start, you start off with small weights, you work out a bit, the next day your muscles are sore, whatever, but you keep at it, right? You keep at it. Eventually you start doing more repetitions, lifting your real weights. Your muscles don't get so tired, whatever. It's the same with, with reading philosophical texts. You know, sometimes you're going to read the text and your mind is going to feel like you're lifting 40 kgs, whatever the case might be. Um, that's why you just got to sort of bite little chunks, see how much you can handle. Um, you know, it, it reaches a point where if you're just pushing through for the sake of pushing through, it also becomes um, unconstructive. Right? Um, so don't feel bad if you didn't understand it. I'll tell you now, someone who was not the easiest person to make sense. So I don't know if it's the translation or if it's actually her writing. I think it's probably a bit of both. Um, but essentially, she's just wrapping up a lot of the conversation she's had throughout the book. We spoke a, a lot about uh, it when we spoke last time about the different personalities and how people fail to live up to the freedom they have. So this week, uh, sorry, so, so this session, we are talking more about, or I should say Simone at this, by this point, is talking more about the features of the genuinely free person. So the, the last section of the book, she discusses different issues related to, let's say, the paradox of freedom. Or I think last time we spoke about the responsibility of freedom. The fact that when you are free, it's not like you can just do whatever you want without consequence. Part of being free is taking responsibility for the consequences of that freedom and what you do with that freedom. And that is one of the big ambiguities of freedom and she discusses this for example in one of the chapters about liberation struggles and whether or not violence is justified in the in the pursuit of freedom and she has you know a complex discussion there to say that you know of, of course there are situations where violence is justified where there's nothing else but violence left if you're going to to move forward with things but we mustn't just assume that that's any situation, but I'll, I'll leave that for later. I just, you know, when I was reading through the chapter, I sort of made notes here about the different types of ambiguities. And ambiguity, if you remember we said last time, ambiguous, ambi means both sides. So ambiguity in the sense that when we're dealing with ethical questions, political questions, because political, ethical and political is really just on the spectrum of, of consideration. Um, things are never going to be 100% clear-cut where you just have this rubric or a checklist of this is what I must do. 
this I9 situation, X32 implement plan, alpha or whatever, when it comes to ethical situations, it's uh, messy and, and dirty and as uh, the Nietzsche book is, is called, a human all to human, right? We fall short. Um, so I actually, I was thinking of a, of a good way of, of having this discussion. I think I want to pose a, a question to you, a, a moral dilemma, let's call it that. And I'm going to try and draw it out um, in clear terms. So just let me know if you're not following. So imagine this case. So you have family one, right? And they are living on the same property with family two. And family one has a pet dog. Now, when you go visit family one, they tell you about how family two is trying to, to steal their dog from you. You know, they're always coming out, giving the dog biscuits and scraps of food and playing with it. And the dog is hardly ever there by then. The dog is always over at family two, even though it's family one as well. So before I continue with, with, the, with the case, what do you think at this stage about the situation? Any thoughts? I think family mm -hmm. one might be misinterpreting the situation, but maybe they're just being kind to the dog, they just dog people. And they enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. It's... And the ambiguity of the word steal, is it really stealing the dog? Or is it simply giving more attention and, like you say, being a dog person? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Fair enough, Matthew. Any thoughts? Well, I mean, dogs respond to um, kind gestures. Mm -hmm. So if they, if they are complaining about their, their second family supposedly stealing their dog, it means the dog is getting the the care and attention from somewhere else. Okay. And, and then, yeah. of course, dogs will respond to mm -hmm. uh, attention like that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so, like, like she said, the idea of stealing becomes quite contestable. Mm. If you, All right. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. Okay, well, I'm glad you're saying this because you decide to head over to Family 2 and mm -hmm. hear what's going on from them and then you hear from them, no, you know, Family 1 is actually not taking very good care of the dog. So, you know, the dog, like you said, the dog is coming over there because it wants to be looked after and they're actually caring for it. But okay. what if family one can't really afford to give the family two? Okay, well, this goes to the next next phase, right? Yeah. Family, family one are taking decently good care of the dog, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not up to the standards that you would maintain your pet, but uh, it's not, not something you could get them in trouble for and, and use as grounds to take the dog away. Conversely, family two, maybe they are spoiling the dog, right? You know, it is family one's dog, and if they have sort of an idea of how they want to care for their dog, is it really fair if family two is like taking their leftover KFC or leftover bones and stuff and constantly feeding the dog? And you know, letting it come in and sleep on the couch and all that kind of stuff. If that's not what family wants for the dog in there, well, I mean, I think I think perhaps the the subject here being the dog makes it makes the situation a bit more um, seems seems easy to kind of uh, sway onto the, the second family. But let's take for example that it was a human being. Mm -hmm. For somebody's wife, for instance, and you were uh, uh, giving all these nice things to, to them. Then uh, I guess because because the the wife is a is a conscious being, any anybody would respond to uh, kindness and uh, certain kind of offers and whatnot. Um, 
then of course the 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 idea of stealing becomes becomes quite um, how how would I say it um, becomes a bit more real um, because you cannot just be doing nice things to someone else as well because because it's a dog we, we are a bit more we can, we can distance ourselves a little bit more because it's not the same um, species. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess what I'm trying to say is, depending on the, the subject, the dilemma also changes a little bit. Um, so, I don't know. <laughs> it's a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. It is yes. ambiguous, right? Mm -hmm. As to the, because mm -hmm. what the situ if you want to boil the situation down, what you have is you have two families with different ideas of how to look after the dog. Mm -hmm. And because the dog is now sharing a home with both of them, mm -hmm. those two families are in conflict because they have different visions. Mm -hmm. And the issue is who's right? Mm -hmm. And you know, like you said, now that question of stealing, maybe it is stealing, right? Because the family two is crossing boundaries. Mm -hmm that family one once established. But on the other hand, that family two feels family one is being negligent. Mm. And both can make a compelling case. Mm. And um, I use this as an example because it's actually a real thing that's happening. I know people that are currently dealing with the situation. And I don't know what to tell them other than... <laughs> Well, shit, <laughs> right, you know, it's your mess, you've got to deal with it, but um, uh, I thought it was a good example. I mean, you know, the dog is fine, the dog is not, I don't know where my Obviously the dog is going to get the best care. Um, <laughs> best of both worlds? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's like, it's kind of like, you know, I've seen this happen in some families when parents get divorced and then the parents have a cold war yeah. for the child's attention, it's like, who can buy it? So this yeah. dog like just getting fed and fed, it's like the dog just walks to this house, gets fed, walks to that house, gets fed. <laughs> um, but I, I used it as a as an example because I think it illustrates this issue of ambiguity, right? Um, quite um, succinctly. And it's a silly example, but you can think about how this might um, play out at a larger scale when you have two different groups of people or two different communities or societies or whatever that have different visions about how things should be and they are now forced to exist, coexist in the same space, live together and make things work. And how do they do that when one thinks it should be X and the other thinks it should be Y? And again, it's not as simple as, well, who's right and who's wrong. Um, there needs to be some sort of mediation. Um, and that's why I tell people I do a lot of work in ethics, but I don't study, you know, what is and what isn't good. My question is how do we even talk about what is and isn't good? Um, because so much of that conversation these days just devolves into shouting and Caps lock on and here I go. <laughs> um, so, uh, this, but this notion of, of ambiguity, I don't actually think it's particularly. I'm reading, I just want to say. Bye. 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 In, in philosophy. I don't know of anyone else who speaks about ambiguity the way Dubois does. But one, one um, there's, a, there's a set of dichotomies, a set of like this or that, which makes up the ambiguity of ethics that I want to discuss. And if you can think of any others as we go along, please do throw them in. But this first one I want to talk about, this goes back to ancient Greek philosophy, ancient Greek metaphysics. Peter, you probably heard me talk about this before. And that is the distinction between these concepts of necessity and contingency. Yeah. And the reason I bring up this distinction is because in the past, in these groups, we've discussed the distinction between necessity versus freedom. 
And obviously the issue of freedom is very important for us in, in, in existentialist philosophy. It's you know, been coming up repeatedly. And we've spoken about how one of the ambiguities, and this is probably one of the central ambiguities that de Beauvoir talks about, is this ambiguity of our necessity, or the word we've tossed about in the past is thrownness, the sense that we find ourselves thrown into the world in a particular situation, that we are born a certain gender, a certain race, in a certain place, at a certain time, in a certain social group, whatever, all these things about us that we can't change, we just have to deal with it, that we aren't free to impact. But then there is this part of our life where we are free to impact. Now, so that's one distinction, necessity versus freedom, but we also then have this distinction of necessity versus contingency. And what what this entails is necessity, and here I'm going to use it the way Aristotle describes mm -hmm. it, is things that cannot admit of being otherwise. In other words, th they have to be the way they are, they cannot be different. Uh, you know, force must equal mass times acceleration. If I let go of this bottle, it will fall to the ground. That's how the law of gravity works. Um, certain logical laws, things like that. Um, fixed ways that the universe operates. Contingent things can admit of being otherwise. It might go one way, it might go the other way. Is it going to rain tomorrow? Maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, should I eat all pizza by myself tonight? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, that all depends. Um, and ever since the ancient times, this distinction has very, been very important for how we understand our knowledge because necessity and those things that occur by necessity are the subjects of stuff like science right, and mathematics. Mm -hmm. But contingency, the things that can admit of being otherwise, that's where we deal with art and ethics and politics. Um, so to me, there's a connection between the term contingency and ambiguity, this idea that it could be one way, it could be the other way. You know, family one could be right, family two could be right. It depends. It depends on the particular situation. Maybe... Maybe today, family one did feed their dog too little, and family two, when they give the dog the scraps, are actually helping it because it's hungry. Maybe the next day, you know, now they're giving it too much, they're overfeeding it, spoiling it, or whatever. It could depend on the context. And that's, that's an old problem with ethics, right? That so much of it deals with the circumstances wherein we act. Sorry, um, mm -hmm. contingency is not a word that I'm familiar with. Um, can we just... Spell it. Huh? Must I spell it? No, no, I know it's right, but I don't know the meaning of contingency. Well, that's what I was explaining now, but it could be... It could go either way. I, yeah, yeah, I'm just... So, I need an for, example. like, a conting to be contingent means yeah. to depend upon. Uh, so, it's contingent, like, uh, okay. I'll pay, whether I, or not I pay you tomorrow, is contingent mm -hmm. upon whether or not I get paid today. Uh, okay. I don't actually have to pay it so it means to depend on it's dependent on other circumstances um, as opposed to like I said like the physical laws force equals mass time acceleration today it should hopefully equal the same tomorrow it won't change yeah. okay. Okay. Um, one, one question um, mm -hmm. so coming back to the example mm -hmm. um, of the of the dog does intention play a role in how how we discuss the issue of ambiguity um, so for example uh, is as, as to as to whether the second family is intentionally trying to feed a dog or they're just eating the dog is around her just take something or whatever it's, it's not they're not in trying to um, attract the dog or anything it's just Contingent, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the, the dog was yeah. just there. That's yeah, that is that is that is exactly the kind of thing that we're talking about in terms of contingent, right? Oh. It makes a very big difference if you know is is the family two just eating the dog runs past and they throw the bone, or is she like collecting the bones and sneaking out? 
yeah. you know, outside the house at night and putting the rose by the door, you know, it makes a big difference. Yes, so intention is a very big part, um, at least in terms of what Simone de Beauvoir is saying. In terms of general different ethical theories, it depends. It depends on who you ask. And um, Peter, I'm going to actually hand this over to you because you've been doing, you did come now <laughs> recently. So there's, they usually talk about three big branches of ethics, like virtue ethics, deontology, and consequentialism. You know the difference mm -hmm. between the utilitarianism. And utilitarianism was consequentialism. Yeah. yeah. So virtue ethics basically um, is what Aristotle drew up. Um, it's finding the mean between an excess like, so for example, I think pride, being prideful is an excess of a virtue, and being humble is a, a deficiency, and the mean between the two is magnanimity. Mm -hmm. So basically, depending on the context, whichever degree uh, is necessary. I mean, for, for example, I think you used the example of a, what is what's necessary for a wrestler to eat mm -hmm. enough. It's going to be... Well, that's the example Aerosol uses. Yeah, exactly. And it's going to be different to what I need to eat. So for his context, that this is a particular mean, and that would be that would constitute the good act. Yeah. And for me, it would be different mm -hmm. means. I obviously have to find that mean. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, am I explaining that? that that's kind yeah, of so, so virtue ethics is about having good character traits. Yeah. And as Peter, Peter is explaining correctly, what that usually means is, depending on the context that you're operating in, uh, there, you're faced with options where you could either do too little or do too much. Yeah. The example I actually used to like is courage. Courage is a virtue because there are moments where you need to be courageous if you're going to act properly. But if you're not, if you don't have appropriate courage, you are a coward. Mm. You have a deficiency. But you can also be have too much courage, as it were, and be reckless, you know, go charging into the burning building, not thinking, and get other people into more mess. Yeah. Um, Which so, degree would maximize yeah. your end. So, like, the example that Aristotle uses is, you know, what what is, a, what is a healthy amount of food for an athlete to eat is going to be different for, you know, a child or an old person or a sick person or whoever, you know, what is right for a person is very much dependent upon who that person is and what the circumstances they act in. So that's essentially virtue ethics at a core. And intention plays a part there because who you are um, and what you intend to do by your actions are very much linked, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a good person, you don't intend to do good, uh, bad things. You want to do uh, good things. And a bad person wants to do bad things, but act like they're good, right? They want to convince themselves that they're good mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, deontology, if you want to explain that. Yeah, deontology basically counts. No, but before, before yeah. you move on. Sorry, I'm... No, no, you I'm can ask. ask. Uh, so, so when, when you're giving the examples, you, it seems like um, virtue is more an individualistic kind of um, kind of thing, either going, or going too far on the right or going too far on the left. You, in terms of pride and... You can also conceptualize it as as a community, right? As okay. how these virtues operate. Um, because what we believe as a group also mm -hmm. is going to determine how we as a community act mm -hmm. and take collective decisions. So from from a traditional perspective, there are virtues are both individual and communal. Mm -hmm. um, it also... Virtues also impact the shape that your... Um, constitution takes, whether it's democratic or aristocratic or um, democratic, aristocratic, or monarchical or whatever. Um, so it, it's not purely individualistic, but it does focus on the person and their character um, to, to a large extent. So it can seem oftentimes mm -hmm. that it is individualistic, but um, who you are is not divorced from your relationship with other people, right? Mm. Whatever that who aspect of, of your identity is. Mm. Yeah. So so at least in a traditional virtue ethics perspective, you always have to take those communal connections into consideration when you are um, 
considering what, why a person does what they do. You cannot isolate them from that context. So, so in, in this case, for instance, um, I mean, generally, people view democracy, mm -hmm. for instance, as something that is good, mm -hmm. which is um, aspirational. For, but um, democracy is quite, it's quite young in the grand scheme of things, with regards to um, like governance structures and whatnot. So, for example, in a typical country, say Saudi Arabia or North Korea, or whatever, um, in the context of Aristotle's view of virtue, mm -hmm. would we say that uh, a country like Saudi Arabia, with all its rules, with the uh, religious um, uh, theocracy and whatnot, is, is mm -hmm. not virtuous because it's not somewhere in the middle? It's, um, I think Arizona would be very clear that um, a country like Saudi Arabia is, uh, so the opposite of virtue is vice. So it would be, he would consider it a vicious oligarchy. Mm -hmm. An oligarchy being a government that is set up where a minority holds control and they exercise control for the sake of the minority's interests. Um, and they are using the appeal to theocracy as a smokescreen um, to, to hide the power structure, you know, by claiming that this is ordained by God or whatever, to, to, for things to be that way. That is just a lie that they are using. Remember we spoke about the notion of a noble lie a, a, a while back. Um, but he would definitely say, I mean, the criteria, uh, you could speak about a virtuous or a vicious state, or you could speak about a just or an unjust state of justice. Mm -hmm. um, what distinguishes a just from an unjust um, community is in an unjust community, those who hold power use their power for the sake of their own interests and they oppress those who are not in power in order to maintain their own power. Mm -hmm. But a just society, as Aristotle defines it, is one way, irrespective of it, whether it's a monarchy, an aristocracy or a democracy, those who have power wield their power for the sake of um, everyone who makes up that community. The, the notion of um, symphonia, as the Greek is where we get symphony from, or harmonia, harmony in society is very important for them. Um, and they would see places like North Korea, South Korea, <coughs> places like the USA today as well, Russia, all these. You know, People who are supposed to be in charge of the UN and, and all these bricks and all that, completely unjust. I think Aristotle would denounce South Africa as being a, an, an oligarchy, essentially, because there is a definite minority who holds power over the infrastructure and um, resources in this country. And the fact that People can't join us in our session today because of load shedding, I think, testifies mm. to the fact that they are obviously not building mm. their authority to the benefit of the people. Um, so, yeah, the virtue ethicists would have a lot to say about um, the failure. A more modern virtue ethicist is this guy called Alistair McIntyre. And he says any institution, whether you're talking about a university or a football club, or a country, a government of a country, whatever, an institution needs at least three virtues if it is going to survive, just maintain itself as a, as a stable institution. And those are justice. People need to get what they deserve for what they do. Courage. People need to stand up and call out corruption and incompetence and bad behavior when it happens. And truthfulness. People need to be open and honest with each other about what the hell is going on in that institution. Otherwise, it's a, it's a, it's a divide, you know, divide and conquer, divide and fall type of situation. Uh, I mean, uh, so for all, yeah. all three of those, uh, say for the last one, it seems like it touches on this ambiguity of ethics. Like you can't say necessarily what amount of things someone, what justifies amount of efforts one puts in, because that, that no, very notion might differ from person to person, this ambiguity 
But you see, that's the thing about objectivity. Remember, we said objectivity is about intersubjectivity. So part of an institution in deciding whether or not people are getting their just desserts means that the people in that institution need to come together and decide what are the appropriate desserts for what type of actions. Right? And people need to then agree on it. It doesn't necessarily have to be unanimous, but again, that's for the community to decide. The community decides, do we need a 51% vote, a two-third vote, or a unanimous vote for decisions to happen? You know, those, all, those kind of things. There's no, like again, there's no objective rule that says work, voting has to work this way or democracy has to work this way. Mm-hmm. We, we decide and build it amongst ourselves. Um, but the, I mean, the notion of justice, if you go read Aristotle, um, justice isn't just one thing. Justice is a constellation of overlapping things that come together and, and play different roles at different times. Because, for example, one part of justice entails having good legislation. Um, I'm trying to think of the, the Greek word nomos, nomos or whatever, which gets translated as legislation, the making of laws, um, which then guide us. But justice also entails recognizing that no amount of legislation is going to account for the vast complexity of um, situations, ambiguity, right? that there's going to become a time where a situation is so unique in, its, in, in you know, how all things come together that the laws actually don't account for it. And then, you know, do you make new laws? Do you up in old laws? Do you just ignore the law for now? But there's a, there's a quality, and the Greek word is epikeia, gets translated as equity in English. And equity is the capacity to, you know, say, okay, well, yes, the laws, this situation is now in a gray area. We need to compromise and work out a resolution that upholds the laws, but also preserves the integrity that we're not, you know, wiping over someone for the sake of laws, because laws exist to protect people. If you're sacrificing people for the sake of the laws, then the laws are defeated. Then they have no point, right? Um, I mean, this is now the fault of the French Revolution and a lot of subsequent revolutions is that they were very much willing to sacrifice people for an ideal. And that is what we were talking about with the serious person. Right? People that are so fixated on upholding whatever values they have, whether it's religious or political or whatnot, they take it so seriously that they're willing to kill for it. And if you're willing to kill for your ideas, then what exactly, if ideas don't exist out there in the world, what exactly are you killing for, right, uh, thin air? So I don't know if that answers, answers your question. We still had to talk about the other two, but I'll get to that now. Yeah. Um, so um, coming back to the Saudi Arabia yeah. issue, I mean, you, you, you mentioned that um, virtue is individualistic, but then again, it is also collective. Isn't it? Um, isn't it a bit, a bit, a bit? I mean, I'm just. This is just. This is a bit harsh to say. For for instance, that um, a typical uh, governance system, like the one in Saudi Arabia, for instance, is a collective uh, system that they've built for themselves. For instance, that's what they used to govern, uh, govern their citizens and whoever. And it seems to be working for them. Um, from from the outside, because the, from the way I see it, however however bad we see it from our mm-hmm. angle, it can definitely be worse. Than it is not. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not. It's not a. It's not a nasty. Whatever. Um, it can get worse than that. Um, so, isn't isn't it perhaps that? Whatever system they have now is something in the in the middle, the magnanimity they mentioned, something in the middle um, that that they've developed over over time. It is entirely possible, mm-hmm. but yeah, is where Saudi Arabia shoots itself in the foot, and um, I'm actually going to use the example. Um, 
about burqas, you know, burqas, the veils mm. that the women wear. And an issue that emerged in feminist discourse, this was many years ago, I don't know if anyone still remembers it, but um, a lot of feminists were, were saying that um, wearing a burqa is misogynistic, that it was sexist towards women. And then a lot of um, Islamic women, Muslim women, turned around and said, you know, no, wearing burqa is a very important part of my religion and my faith, and I choose to wear a burqa. And your decrying, your uh, demonizing this thing is actually Islamophobic, right? It's Western bourgeois feminism trying to impose a colonial mindset on um, Middle Eastern communities. That was the counter argument. The problem is, though, with a place like Saudi Arabia, is to what extent are women actually able to, to genuinely voice their opinions about things? Um, can I really trust if I see a blog post from a Saudi Arabian woman about how wonderful it is to wear a burqa and how much she loves being obedient to her husband? Can I really trust that? If I know that, if it's only because it says that, that that article was allowed to be published, where all the other articles that, that decry the book, written by Saudi women, are not published. And what, what I'm saying with this is Saudi Arabia has destroyed its own um, public sphere, as it were, right? You know, they've persecuted journalists, they've assassinated journalists, they suppressed these different minority groups in the country. So because we cannot have an honest conversation with either the people in charge of Saudi Arabia or the people being quote-unquote oppressed, uh, we can't get a good sense of whether or not that is actually the ideal system. And I, like again, to go back to Aristotle, Aristotle says we must keep in mind two distinctions. The ideal, the ideal society or ideal community, as we could best possibly conceive it, you know, all our wildest dreams come true, and the best possible society that is actually practically realized, and that's part of the ambiguity, right? We can use this vision of a utopia to guide us, but we must recognize that there are going to be limits, you know, depending, you know, if you live in the desert versus whether you live in uh, the middle of a rainforest, you're going to have very different realities concerning food, for example. Just practical things like that are also going to impact, you know, issues of disease and all these kind of things that just snowball all the way up your legislative and deliberative processes that, practically speaking, what might be the ideal society for that community at that place in that time might fall far short of what we would hope. But if it was a healthy society, there would be very robust discussion amongst different people in that community about their experiences and what their expectations are. And I just don't see a place like Saudi Arabia doing that. Um, you know, it's the same issue with, with Russia right now, if you look at their narrative and what the, the bullshit they sell their, their people about what goes on in the Ukraine. Um, the question to ask, right, is how, how liable is the Russian soldier for their participation in the Ukraine? Because if they genuinely believe that the Ukrainians are these like bloodlusted neo Nazis, then in their minds they're justified to go to war, right? But if that whole belief is based on a lie, on and, and they're sort of culpable for that lie because they've allowed that a lie to develop over years and years and haven't done anything. We talked about the subhuman, right? The people that come and just go along. Those are the those those, you know, when you see pictures of those conscripts. In the front lines, I can, you know, those are all the kind of people that Simone de Beauvoir is talking about when she's talking about the subpersons, these kind of people that are just like, well, I guess I'm going to, to Ukraine now. I'm going to go kill me some Ukrainians because that's what I've been told to do. They stuck a gun in my hand. And it's only because other people in the, in the barracks are causing a stir that these conscripts actually fight back. Um, so, so there's this really big question, question about is Saudi Arabia actually the best that it can realize for itself? And my answer is, I don't know. 
and I don't think we can know until it, it improves um, its public sphere, basically. But it can't do that. To me, the, the, the indication is it can't do that without severely disrupting the existing power structures. And those power structures probably don't want that disruption, which is to me a good indication that it's probably an unjust government. Right? If the government is specifically looking to prevent its own people from discussing the conditions that they live in, that's oppression. <laughs> well, well, I mean, I mean, let me let me let me use a, a, a Ghanaian historical mm -hmm. uh, fact as an example. So I'm I'm doing uh, research on um, a popular music type in Ghana called hip life music, mm -hmm. and from my readings, I came across this historical fact of women and how they appear in terms of dress. Mm -hmm. And apparently, during the colonial colonial period in Ghana, the idea of the lady became quite popular. So women in Ghana were not the woman. The woman's sexuality was never associated with what she wore before colonialism. But through colonialism and whatnot, it was became, it became very much associated. So if you were a woman and you, 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 you dressed in some kind of way, you were, you were seen to be loose mm. and indecent. And, and this became the narrative for so many years, up until now, that if during summer, just like a lot of women uh, in South Africa during summer, they wear, they wear less clothes, let me put it that way. They show a bit more skin because it's hot. Mm -hmm. Now, because of this colonial ideal that, that has uh, seeped into the Ghanaian traditional psyche, now people complain about women dressing that way. Even Ghanaians themselves complain about people dressing that way. Now, looking at the, the, how, how this, this tradition has evolved over time, would we say, for instance, that um, the way Ghanaians are addressing now is the ideal or, um, because they've been influenced by colonialism now, now then that becomes a bad thing but it's, it's hard to mm. actually actually tell I'm saying this in, in, in connection to, to the Saudi Arabian situation that isn't our opinion about the Saudi Arabian condition influenced by our own backgrounds of how we how we uh, how we practice yes. Uh, so, for example, Definitely. the um, the the statement that you made, for instance, that um, we will never know if the South African, I mean, the Saudi Arabian situation is is that is just or not, because the this you don't think there's ever going to be some sort of discussion to to ascertain whether mm -hmm. people are being oppressed, people are really being oppressed, or something else, but. The, the question that I, I keep having in my mind is why do you want to have a discussion? That, that idea of having a discussion is also that, that it's, 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 coming, it's coming from a democratic place of let's, let's discuss, let's come into a consensus what's not about how things are supposed to be done. In other places, the tradition, the way the, the organize their systems, it's not a matter of let's discuss. It's the guys at the top are the ones who make the decisions, and everybody's okay. Some people might have problems with it. Yes, of course, even in democracies, it's always like that. But how do we how do we strike the the balance in our thoughts of someone else's system, which is also influenced by our own background, our understanding, our own experience of of a governance system, for instance. Well, this, this is the question that I'm working on in a lot of my research, so I don't have a, a, a final answer for you. Um, I mean, in terms of... I can make two, two distinctions here. You know, historically speaking, it's always been a mess in terms of, uh, you know, this is the saying, empires rise and fall, but evil is eternal. Uh, I think I got that off a of magic card, actually. Um, <laughs> You know, there have been democratic societies that have emerged over time. Um, 
you know, thousands of years, they come and they go. Most societies, most political communities have been hierarchical. They have a king mm. or some, you know, small group of um, mm. nobles or whatever that, that run the place. But amongst themselves, the, the idea is still amongst themselves. They engage in what, in a democracy, would occur a large scale, but they mm. deliberate about what goes on. And it's that deliberation between the people that sets these standards, right? It's those people in their discussion that decide, hey, you know, what is the appropriate amount of clothing for a woman to wear, right? And then, you know, if it's a bunch of grumpy old men, oh, we've got to cover it up, you know, don't let them see their ankles, or go blind, or whatever. And then other people will be like, no, you know, it's hot, it's practical to wear short sleeves, whatever the case might be. And they have that discussion, they decide amongst themselves. And then when they, as a community, make that decision, it is then up to the people of the community to live up to that decision. But they also, you know, decide how strict they are about it, right? If they decide, you know, women shouldn't wear um, short skirts, but if you get caught wearing a short skirt, you know, maybe it's not reasonable to put you, uh, you know, to the guillotine or whatever. It's not a death penalty crime, right? I mean, there's some lenience towards that. Those kind of decisions are all entirely up to the community. It has to come from within and as a res you know, result of what the circumstances are, what kind of situation they're, they're involved in. I mean, I think that, that's one of the criticisms about modern nation states, the kind of governments and polities we have now is countries are just too big. They are, they are too large geographically and they are too large in terms of their populations to really account for everybody. Not everyone can have an equal say in how things work. And electing representatives isn't always a good um, compromise, you know, isn't a good substitute because how much do we actually know about what goes on in the government on a day-to-day -day basis and why the people make the decisions they do and, and, mm. and all that kind of stuff. You know, to, the vision, I think, of, of a political community, if you want to... The, the classical vision is, of course, the Senate in Rome or in, in Athens, you know, the men coming together in the togas as a group and discussing the problems of the city or, you know, in the South African context, you might talk about something like an Indaba, right, or a Khotla people coming together, usually it's the elders and the head male of the family and maybe the older son will come with as well because he has to learn mm -hmm. and they all get together and they talk, right? And ultimately you might have a king or a chief or whoever who has mm -hmm. what we would today consider executive function, right? Mm -hmm. So it's ultimately for him to decide yes or no, but he makes his decision based on what the elders say, mm -hmm. what, the, what the representatives of the different families say. Um, and the question is, do we see anything like that happening in Saudi Arabia? I don't. And that is why I have to question whether or not, um, you know, what they're doing is the right thing. But that's why I don't, you know, why I say I don't know is I, I can't go now and say, you know, Saudi Arabia is this and that and the other because I don't know all the details. I haven't been to Saudi Arabia. I haven't spoken to many people from Saudi Arabia. So I am not in a position to make qualified condemnation. All I can say is that I don't see anything that makes me smile and say, wow, way to go, Saudi. Uh, you know, keep, keep it up. Um, but I mean, that is really an issue with any government, really. I think we are at a point now where we have to... I mean, we, we, we live in what a lot of philosophers call post-enlightenment world. You had the Enlightenment 200 years ago where you had the French Revolution, the American Revolution, all these other revolutions, and people had this very wonderful vision about what they thought the world could be like, and they thought, you know, they were going to, through colonization, they were going to take that around the globe. And that vision is failing everywhere, everywhere, not just in certain countries. Um, and I don't think... It's going to be like some sort of apocalyptic fallout for fallout five kind of vision of, of things. Um, I think we are in what um, Friedrich Nietzsche, another existentialist, 
cause an age of decadence. And you could think about the Roman Empire in the last two, three hundred years of its existence, uh, the Western Roman Empire at least, right? So you just have this slow, gradual decay in society where there was this increasing separation between um, the small elite who owned all the land and all the resources and all the, all the military power and the increasingly growing masses of mass. You know, because usually what happens is you have the middle class and the middle class you either have the few that bump up to the upper class or a lot of them fall away and join the lower class. And that's increasing what happened. And that's where you get the feudal system and the dark ages that emerged, right? Because as Rome collapsed, people formed communities around those centers of power because they were the people had the resources. So those old Roman aristocratic families became the new medieval warlords and barons and stuff. Um, but yeah, that's sort of in the long way to say what I mean by an age of decadence, right? This slow, gradual decline. We're going to find that countries and communities we have now, we just cannot handle the infrastructure necessary to maintain it. And it's obvious now with the electricity crisis, the water crisis, the food crisis, the road crisis, all these crises, um, because it's too much. It's too much, spread over too much. Um, so, you know, the, the, these issues of ambiguity are always going to crop up. And part of Simone de Beauvoir, and you can listen to the, the, the recording for the last session to hear this, part of the issue for Simone de Beauvoir is these people that she calls the serious person, these people who think that there are these fixed values that you just have to uphold at all cost. Um, they, they cause a lot of trouble for us um, because they are so firmly fixed that their ideas are right. Um, and if, if you don't agree with them, it must be because you're wrong. And if you're wrong, it means you're a bad person. That kind of thinking is not constructive. Um, what we need is people who are willing to um, be open with dialogue and, and deliberation and discussion, not, and not be so um, defensive, right? And so assertive that it's my way. And if you don't follow my way, it's because you're oppressing me. That's also an issue that emerges, right? Um, mm -hmm. But that's just the sense of childishness, right? That's how a child behaves. Give me my, I want my bottle now, and if I don't get it, I'm going to cry. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Simone de Beauvoir talks a lot about child and children, and you know, we spoke about again this issue last time about you know, part of growing up, you know, is, is learning that you have responsibility. Becoming an adult is learning that you have responsibility for your own freedom, and a lot of adults just never seem to learn that lesson um, how to take responsibility. Um, but in terms of the intent, uh, the intention. Another thing, and I think this is important, and, and de Beauvoir also talks about this in the final chapter, is the distinction between means versus ends. And what this is, is um, the end is obviously the goal that, that you are intending to realize, and the means are the actions that you take in order to realize those goals. And um, there's an old question of, does the end justify the means? Can, can the goal be so great that any action is, is worthwhile? Um, or does the means justify the end? Does it work that way? And that's also part of the ambiguity. Another interesting question is you have some activities where you have an end, where you pursue some action, and you realize that end once the action is complete, like you, know, you paint the picture, and once you've done painting, is the painting actually there? English is weird sometimes, um, the artwork is there. But then you also have some actions that are ends in themselves, where it's not like you do, you do, you do, you do the thing, and then once you stop doing it, then you have it. It's while you're actually doing the thing that the goal is being realized. And to give an example from last week, play. You know, it's not like a child plays for three hours, and at the end of the three hours, they, there I have my complete... My complete play now for me is done. The, the, the play is an end in itself. They're doing it for its own sake. And these are also, and this goes to, to virtue ethics, 
this distinction is very important in virtue ethics thinking. Um, some things, some actions we undertake only because the outcome from that action is going to be good and the action has to be evaluated in terms of that end. But other actions are also just good in their own sake and must be evaluated in their own terms irrespective of what the outcome is. And this is sort of goes against the two big modern schools of ethics. The one, Manuel Kant, and it's called deontology. Deontology is the fancy word meaning duty. So this idea that there are certain principles which are sort of just um, logic, logical formulations. I'm not going to get too much into this now because I don't want to get there. Yeah. But this idea that your actions are good because you are intending to uphold these values. The, you have a duty to these values. And it is your intention in upholding that duty that makes your action good. Consequentialists, or also utilitarianisms, they believe that it's the consequences of an action, the end, that is good. So the, usually the, the saying is the maximum happiness for the maximum number of people, the, the greatest good for the greatest uh, amount. Um, so they don't care. Consequentialists don't give a shit what your intentions are. You know, they'll tell you the road to hell was paved with good intentions. Mm -hmm. All that matters, proof is in the pudding, right? Uh, so... That again is part of the ambiguity of, of ethics that sometimes we can have good intentions but because life is so unpredictable, because there is contingency, things can go one way or the other, uh, we don't have 100% control over what the outcome of what we're going to do. And I'm sure you've all done something in your life where you thought you were doing something nice and you actually <laughs> made a mistake, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> and again, you say, is that right or is it wrong? It's it's for you, the community, right? If, if you messed up, you were intending something good, but you messed up, you then have to talk to that person, right? And it's between you and them to resolve whether or not this is now some travesty or it's just a simple misunderstanding and you can move on. Um, but this notion of an end in itself... Um, it's kind of weird, right? It's a, how can something be an end in itself? Um, if you if you start thinking about it too logically, it does become a bit of a contradiction. But I think practically speaking, like I gave the example of play, it makes sense, right? And the example I, I think I gave this in a previous session of one of these sessions is the example of the firefighter who runs into a burning building. You know, if a firefighter runs into a burning building to save someone, irrespective of whether they actually get that person out safely or the building collapses on them, we still think they're brave, right? Because they risk their life. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, it doesn't matter the consequences. It's not just because he failed. Now we say, oh, what an idiot he ran into that building. <laughs> you know, we still say, you know, we have respect for that guy. So there are circumstances where um, definitely the consequences don't make an impact. And the intention is very, very important. Um, the issue with intention, though, is, and this is where the issue of subjectivity becomes really crucial, is you can never really know another person's intention, right? Because you cannot look into their mind. They could be lying about, they could even, they might not necessarily even be lying. They could just not fully understand their own intentions. Again, that's the sub, the subhuman, right? Um, but, I mean, if you think about it, even from your own perspective, you can never communicate your intentions to anyone else. No matter how much you sit and explain why you did what you did, you cannot communicate all the complex web of emotions and thoughts and feelings um, that you experienced, apart from just the rational, this is what happened type of thing. Right? There's much more to it. Uh, Hannah Arendt talks about this, you know, she says, Pain is one of the most universal experiences. Everyone knows what it means to be in pain. But have you ever tried to describe your pain to someone? You can never really know that they really are thinking. If you say to you, it was the, it was the most painful thing I've ever experienced. Even if you think about the most painful thing you've experienced, we don't know that that's the same type of pain. Mm -hmm. 
and that's the problem with subjectivity and it's the same problem with intention is that you can never really communicate intention um, to each other um, anything you guys want to say about this uh, before I'm just taking the time now, before I move on to some of the other stuff just that I agree <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah like I said I just drew up a list of ambiguities here that um, I picked up on Another thing that De Beauvoir discusses is this notion between positive and negative freedom. Now, we must not get confused yet because I actually was confused for a moment when I was reading her. Excuse me. Uh, Peter, do you remember the distinction between positive and negative freedom? No. Okay. So, positive means to add something, negative means to take away, subtract, right? So, negative freedom is the freedom you have when obstacles have been removed. So, for example, imagine I hired someone to stand at this door and say only such and such a type of person is allowed and they block everyone else from entering this room and being part of this community, right? That is now an obstacle that is in the way of whoever is not being allowed in. If that person now gets tackled and moved out of the way and the people now can freely walk into the room, that's negative freedom. Or, for example, when they renounce the apartheid laws, right? And all the restrictions that those imposed on non white people. That was gaining of negative freedom. Positive freedom is when you need to add something in order to make freedom realized. So, to use the example of, of the door, imagine I didn't have anyone there. I said, it's free to enter, anyone can come in. But imagine there was a step, you know, some steps leading up the door, so that a person with a wheelchair couldn't get in. Even though I'm not blocking them, I'm not putting any sign or laws or any bounce or anything there to prevent them from coming in, because there's no access ramp for them, they actually lack freedom. So if I build an access ramp, I am adding something to the world that then allows them to participate. So I'm granting them positive freedom. And that's also very important. I mean, that's that's part of the discussion we have around things like universal health care or you know, universal education and things like that. That is part of the discussion of positive freedom. We need to actually give something to people if they are going to be as free as the rest of us. Um, but that's actually not what Simone de Beauvoir is meaning by positive and negative freedom. Mm -hmm. She is talking, and I'm young to talk about in terms of the positive moment and the negative moment. And um, again, this goes back to that metaphor about the metamorphosis in Nietzsche. But um, we can maybe talk about that later. There's time. But what she means by the positive and negative moments in freedom is that freedom entails two things. And the negative moment, again, this is. You know, you're subtracting something. So the negative moment is throwing off seriousness, to use her words, or getting rid of seriousness. The negative moment of freedom is when you realize that you can say no to other people, right? You've been living by your parents' rules or your teacher's rules, whatever, and then at a certain stage when you grow up, you realize, hey, I can actually say no to these things. I don't have to do what everyone tells me all the time. Um... So it's negating in, and subtracting those rules and opening up the space now for you to act without those impositions. But this is now, and, and remember, this is if you remember the people we spoke about last week, this is what the nihilist does. And the, the serious person moves from their attachment to these objective principles and they reject it and they say, no, I'm not going to stick by your rules. I'm going to make my own rules or whatever the case is. And that's where the positive moment is. That's when you're adding or prescribing um, your own values, right? So you actually have to go out and decide for yourself. What do I believe in? What do I agree with? What, what am I about? Who am I? And what do I stand for? Um, she says the negative, she, she says the positive moment is more difficult, obviously, because you actually, the negative moment is just, Saying, I'm done. God, throwing away. 
But the positive moment actually has entails you having to come to terms with who you are and deciding, you know, what do I believe and, and seeing if it works, right? And failing and maybe messing up and having to do things again. But the negative moment, she says, is more genuine because usually it emerges from, um, in, in Christianity, they talk about affliction in Christian philosophy, this immense suffering and oppression where you finally just say enough is enough I cannot take it anymore. have you seen the movie Network mm-hmm. uh, you guys must watch that Network is an old movie from the 70s about so well we can think about it in terms of social media but it was about television when he has this quote he says I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore you know, and he has everyone on television repeat that often because he's the news anchor mm-hmm. um, that's the negative moment right say I'm, I'm pissed off and I'm enough is enough um, so there's an ambiguity between those two because in a sense remember we said even if there's no objective principles uh, that doesn't mean that the principles that you make for yourself are meaningless and that's part of the problem um, anything you want to say I think I'm going to We've actually touched on a lot of this stuff. Mm. I think probably the main, one of the other main ambiguities, and this one, the last ambiguity I'm going to um, talk about before I start wrapping it up, or heading towards the wrap-up, is the distinction between the self and the other. We spoke about this, but when we spoke last time about, you know, recognizing, you you recognize yourself as a self-conscious being when you, when you recognize other conscious beings other people and part of being a genuinely free person is recognizing and respecting the um, freedom that other people have but as as she talks about in some of the other chapters this is difficult because we tend to step on each other's toes so to speak right you know you're trying to live your life other people are trying to live their lives you know this is how family one thinks their dog should be treated. This is how family two thinks the dog should be treated. Um, and they're both trying to live their, their free selves, but they, they're kind of getting each other away. Um, and we almost inescapably almost end up always you know, putting limits on other people's freedom. Right? Either that or we have to put limits on our own freedom to respect theirs. So there never really is the sense of an absolute total freedom that I can just do whatever I want, whenever I want. Yeah. Um, and that is probably the, the probably the most important ambiguity to reconcile because the failure to reconcile the difference and the similarities between the self and the other is often the cause of a lot of violence. And, um, you know, this, the, 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 he's talking about the means and ends, for example. Right? Kant famously said one of his moral laws is that we should never treat another human being as a means. We should always treat them as an end, i.e. a person is not a tool to be used. There is something with dignity that you have to respect. But, I mean, this, this is an idea that goes all the way back. It's, Christianity, we are all created in the image of God. And even even in a limited extent, some of the, the Greek thinkers touch upon this idea of, of, a, of a sense of humans as ends in themselves. Um, and that is sort of the, the, <coughs> the, the, the distinction between self and other also mirrors the distinction between subject and object. And what I mean here is an object as a thing. Right, you, you are all just things to me, and I am a thing to you out there in the world. Um, but I am also a subject, I can act, and you're also subjects, you can act. Um, so, so that ambiguity, you know, there's kind of like it's like a Venn diagram how these things overlap. Yeah. Um, but I think that's where I'm going to leave that list. I have some other things that I want to, to wrap up with but uh, let me throw the conversation back to you guys how are you enjoying things so far Matthew and following me <laughs> <laughs> no, no I'm enjoying Matthew's interview mm. <laughs> I have to have a new energy 
Wes Ashley. Very glad you got him. <laughs> yeah. Peter, do you have anything you want to add? Um, no, I'm just processing it all. Yeah, it's a lot to process. Um, I'm just thinking, there's this, in the book, there's this chapter called the uh, Antinomies of Action. Yes. Um, I must admit, in a lot of the chapters I didn't entirely follow that she mm. was referring to. But you were speaking about this distinction, or these ambiguities between self and other um, subject, object, and whatnot, uh, positive freedom, negative freedom. And I'm thinking um, this freedom we have, it feels as if she, she this is just my, my summary from what I was saying, the freedom she equated to the ability to rationalize. Mm -hmm. We have rationalization above all other species. And within this kind of realm, in this either subjective rationalization or intersubjective rationalization, this is where we have our moral codes, whatnot, whatnot. This is this is where we understand life. This is where meaning mm -hmm. occurs. Um, and no matter what you do, you are kind of. I think what's what gave me a little existential dread when I read it is, you are um, complicit in making meaning that could, that has uh, the potential of taking someone else's meaning away. Mm -hmm. And that's something that kind sure. of, and you can't, you can't get, you can't be free of that. Because you possess that, as a human, you possess this freedom, you possess this rationality. And you can't even say, listen, I'm just going to be an entirely ambivalent, indifferent person. Even that in itself, it's not choice. some action. It's not yeah, a choice. It's yeah. a choice. That's just a uh, huge responsibility to bear, because... But that's that's the sub-person, right? The sub-person is the one who completely rejects that. Yeah. And just lives passively. Yeah. And that's the issue, right? That's the thing about being human. Um, not specifically that we have rationality, because I do think there are other rational creatures, but we can deliberate. We can think exactly. ethically. Um, in a way that I think is probably more superior to what animals deliver. Maybe animals have some minor ethic, really minor ethical deliberations. A animals certainly have practical deliberations. And you could say that practical, practical, the practical is a genus of which ethical is a species. But that's not philosophy talk, I don't want to bother too much yet. Um, and the, the, yeah, so the thing about a human being is that what, what deliberation means is we can plan. And that was sorry, another of the ambiguities that I have here is that she talks about that's very important, but I actually don't want to get, go down this rabbit hole between the present and the future. Yes, yes. That's the present and the future. Humans can prepare for the future in the way that it, animals can't, at least from what we can see. We can, animals very much are passive in the sense of reacting, you know, Okay, so now it's raining, I have to go find somewhere to go sleep, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll maybe stay in the same place every time it rains, so long as it's still there or they don't get chased away. Whatever. But a human can think, well, you know, uh, looking at the, the, the sky and all that, it looks like it, it might rain. Uh, I need to build myself a shelter. To build a shelter, I need to go gather some twigs and stuff, and they can sort of set out a whole sequence mm. of actions for themselves and and based on that deliberation that is when the notion of good and bad comes mm. when we're trying to evaluate those kind of decisions a, an animal just does right they, they'll try if they see the doors open they'll stick their head through and look and see and mm. whatever happens they'll respond i mean animals do plan but in a very limited sense i don't know I, this is just me watching my dogs over the last few years. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've seen my, my animals problem solve. I've actually seen my animals play, they've played tricks on me. And that takes planning. You know, like they'll hide their toys from me and things like that, deliberately, because they're playing. Um, but that is not the freedom that, that the Beauvoir is talking about. 
And that's why the subperson is named a subperson, somehow less than human, because they're completely renouncing that capacity to make decisions, to make choices. That in itself is probably the only choice they make. But that is why they always sort of just go along with the tide, um, because they aren't making their choice. So it's supposed to be bleak um, from some, someone who was put in view. Freedom is not something to celebrate. It's something to be very somber about. And that is, to me, the ultimate ambiguity that I've written in here about this whole thing is that we can take our own values seriously. It's seriously in the way that, that Simone de Beauvoir means. Like, you know, we, we set up our own values for ourselves, whatever we believe, like X is good, Y is beautiful, Z is true, whatever. We set those up for ourselves. But when we act, when we go about our daily business, it's not like we stop every time and rethink about the fact that, well, you know, this isn't actually a real metaphysical truth. You know, I only believe this because of all these contingent things. You act as if this is an absolute truth and you need to uphold it because that's just practical. Like, I think the example I gave last time was about going to class, right? right? There's no set of stones somewhere that says you have to attend every class on time. If not, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, right? Um, you decide for yourself, okay, I take class seriously, I'm going to make sure I attend all my classes, I'm going to make sure I'm going to be on time. Um, that's a decision you make for yourself, but the, you know, when you wake up in the morning, you don't want to go through that process, the deliberation of deciding every time whether or not to do that. You just say to yourself, well, I have to be at class, I'm going to go, and you try to live up to that. And that is what, what she's sort of saying, is that we don't have to feel completely hopeless if if it turns out that there aren't these tr truths out there that I can think that can guide us. And again, we don't actually even have to agree with it. It could be very well that there are objective truths out there. But what she points out is it's still we who decide whether or not to live by them. Right? Whether or not the truths come from outside or they, they come from inside. We decide whether or not to uphold them. So I put here, we can take our own value seriously, parentheses, just not too seriously. Right? Because like I said before, the people who begin to take their values too seriously, that's when they begin stepping on each other's toes and start imposing on other freedom. But that again is um, to be expected. Again, this is something, I, I, did you see the post I posted on Facebook? With the quote from James Baldwin and Anna Arendt earlier today. It was new, I posted that. But both of them talk about the fact that thinking and acting, the human beings, they are thinking and acting is unpredictable. You never know what someone is going to do or, or what they're going to you know, some thought that's going to emerge and how that is going to create a chain reaction or whatever the case might be. That's why we should never take our ideas too seriously because you never know when you're going to go through something that completely upends your experience of, of the world and you have to reevaluate your, your, your ideas about things. And uh, I'm going to finish off with a quote from, from the book. Um, what the the Bavar writes, Vigilance alone can keep alive the validity of the goals and the genuine assertion of freedom. And I've highlighted that word, vigilance. I think, um, I don't know if I want to call vigilance a, a virtue in itself, but I think it's something, or, or a value in itself, but I think it is something that's sort of a prerequisite to values, much like I argue discipline is in that other article I wrote from the UFS. Um, Discipline and vigilance, you know, you, part of your existence as, as an ethical mature adult is recognizing that um, you never know, you never know when you're going to be called upon to act, when your beliefs and values are going to be called to, called to question and called to, you know, be brought to bear. So there is this constant sense of like I said, we, we have to take our values seriously, but not too seriously. 
And that balance requires vigilance of constant, again, the Delphic oracle, know yourself, constant self-reflection. And, 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 and again, not to make this too individualistic, self-reflection, but also an appreciation of what is going on in your community. I mean, people want to talk about um, modern individualism, and you can see that if you just talk about to people about who who who's their neighbours are, who what are the shops and the people that work there in, in your area, what are their names, things like that. People don't even know the people that live around them every day. Um, so how if they don't even know them, how are they going to handle these crises that emerge? Now there's no street lights. Now there's a fire. Whatever the case might be, uh, you know this issue with the dog, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's part of the, the responsibility that I've been emphasizing about freedom is that it requires this vigilance, this constant uh, readiness. Let's not get carried away with paranoia, right? <laughs> <laughs> but there is the sense of you don't want to fall back into a position where by the time you realize what's going on, it's too late to act. Yeah. But that's... All my story. I have some other story here at the back, but I don't think I'm going to bother with that. Uh, we actually had such a nice conversation. No one joined us in the group, unfortunately. Uh, but I think I'm going to just leave it to run because I want to check the audio, which is better. But otherwise, any other final thoughts, Matthew? Did you enjoy your first session? I know you came into this blind. <laughs> Probably was a bit confusing at times. I no, I mean, um, um, I did um, political science. You know, okay, yeah. Um, when I was doing my undergrad, so um, did a bit of uh, medieval political towards. Mm -hmm. So I know bits and pieces of. So that's that's what I'm very very um, interested in philosophy and, and some of the ideas of some of these movies with philosophers. For well, then you must uh, check out Sorry. my YouTube channel. Sorry? You must check out my YouTube channel there. Maybe there's some videos that will interest you. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, I'll check it out. So, I want to mention you. mentioned mention you. Okay. That's cool. Nice, cool. Yeah. nice having you. Yeah. Uh, we, we meet every two weeks. So, the next one mm -hmm. will be on the 2nd of December. Like I said, we're doing Nazis Gilmatic. Yeah. And then, uh, already, we've already worked out the schedule for um, next week. I've designed a, a mock up calendar which I'll post on social media soon so you can just follow us for that uh, and you can see all the other stuff that we'll be doing next year. But like I said, there's no obligation. Week, this, uh, okay, two weeks, the last one for That's the last year. one for this year. Then we'll start again in February. Just wait for all the students to come back. And, uh, I also need I need a break to catch up on my dissertation. I was <laughs> shy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it was cool having you. So you so you a violent tutor. Yes, uh, my Valentine tutor, my violinist, um, completing my master's in the office. Sure. Yeah. You know, we have so many musicians in this group, we should really just start <laughs> <laughs> without, without I'll be the manager of the band, so I can't do music. You can clap and I'll clap for that. <laughs> but yeah, Peter, anything you want to say? No, no, I am. Um, like I said, there's actually a lot of things going on, but if I mention them, it's like that you know, these sessions are going to go way beyond that. But Mark, on behalf of the whole group, I just want to thank you for always being so prepared and yeah. um, you're and always on time, always sending the material you yeah, are. Even you're it's always, your attitude is always positive. <laughs> whether there's one of us, whether there's ten of us, you're always giving everything. And thank you for starting this group. Thank you. We really yeah. appreciate it. I really appreciate you saying that and I appreciate you attending. It's been fun. I'm trying yes. to think. We've been doing this now since July. Did we start this oh, the first time? I think so. Yeah. June, July. July, I think. Yes. Yeah. Mm. yeah we, I missed, think we missed some because of sickness. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then we didn't have a venue for the one. But Beverly's been really nice. She's looked after us. Yeah, she's yeah, awesome. Mm. Then... Uh, yeah, next next month we're doing the NAS, and then I'm also presenting. I'm doing a presentation on philosophy and Dragon Ball uh, on the seventeenth. Yeah, in this room. Mm. Uh, 
Um, so, but that's also on, on my social media, so you can check there. I don't know if you're into Dragon Ball or um, no, into games. <laughs> <laughs> the anime? You didn't watch the anime? <laughs> but uh, those are the, the two talks that I'm doing this year. Uh, or the two sessions. Did you yeah. also collect the slammers? Yes. I've still got, I've got a shoebox really? full of, uh, we called them Tarzos back in the yeah. day. Yeah. Tarzos. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember Tarzos? Because you remember found the Tarzos. chips packets. There's little, little round, round plastic discs. That or not. Did it, uh, okay. uh, I, don't I, don't we, I don't think we had it in Ghana. Uh, okay. Are you from Ghana? Yes. School. So you are studying? Yeah. So, if there's nothing else, and I think we can wrap up. Uh, wrap it up. Yeah, Simone de Beauvoir is quite a tough one. Yeah, are you? Um, probably tougher than um, any of the others. I'm trying to think maybe Nietzsche will be a bit of a ball buster, but that's because he's trying to be a ball buster. <laughs> <laughs> but next year is going to be a lot simpler than this. I don't know if there's anything that but she's not even the most difficult. I'm really, I'm really not looking forward to when we finally have to get around to doing Heidi. Oh, because Heidi goes something else. <laughs> I don't even think Heidi knew what Heidi was saying. <laughs> he was just not channeling some dark chaos world or something. I'm waiting till we do Hegel. I don't know if we can do Hegel at UFS, but from right up there, he's got quite a reputation, reputation for being unintelligible. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, Hegel the being of the being is its being. You know, it's one of those kind of philosophies. Where he uses the word being three times in the same time. Each, each, <laughs> each being each means being a different means, each being means no. a different being. You know, that kind of stupid shit. Uh, oh, but there's something yeah, there's something to the water so it says quite frequently in this book which kind of confuses me is that 